Glory to God. Open your Bible this morning to Jeremiah 29, and uh, we're talking this morning about searching. Yeah, we're going to find Jeremiah 29. This is a, probably a familiar scripture to uh, lots of people. There we go. Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. Are you there? Now, I can't even tell you to go get a really cool Bible because these are not being printed anymore. But if you do have a really cool Bible, you'll be on page 1013. Okay. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord... After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and will bring you back from your captivity. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Lord, we thank you this morning for grace. Lord, how kind and compassionate you are towards the people you have made. And Lord, this morning, as uh, we open your word and open our hearts, Father, I pray that your word becomes that good seed that finds good ground in us today to make us fruitful for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, there's uh, a lot of buffering. You know, guys, you guys know what buffering is? Buffering is, yeah, when you, uh, not buffeting, buffering. <laughs> buffering is what happens on my computer all the time. I try to do something, that little wheel comes up there and it starts spinning. Or it says, um, your computer is going to automatically update in within 24 hours. And, and so when that happens, then I'm trying to use the computer, and that little wheel pops up there, and it says 32%. Five minutes later, 35%. And, and that's buffering. Okay? People are, are caught in the spinning wheel these days. Uh, it's probably always been like this. People are searching for ways to get out of the spinning wheel and out of this captivity of, uh, of whatever they think normal is that doesn't seem to have a lot of hope in the future. I was uh, listening to a guy, or actually I was reading an article about, from a guy who was uh, a POW in uh, 1990 and 91 in the Gulf War. And he was a pilot that was shot down and he was tortured and beaten regularly and he said it was really hard to focus on the future because he didn't know what the future if there was going to be a future he said it was easier to to get his mind to focus on the past and think of the memories but he didn't really want to look forward because he didn't know what was out there so people are looking they're they're caught in this place a lot of people looking for the spark that's really going to bring life to life Bring my life to life. And history, myth, tradition, legend uh, is filled with stories of people searching for the fountain of youth. And when I thought of the fountain of youth, there was a name that came to my mind. Anybody knows what name that is? Ponce de Leon. Well, after reading up and find, uh, there's nothing, he never wrote anything there's nothing recorded about him talking about a fountain of youth. A lot of other people did. Uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, let's see. Alexander the Great searched for the fountain of youth in the 4th century A.D. and was said to have come across a healing river of paradise. And the legendary king Prester John claimed to rule a land that had a fountain of youth during the early crusades of the 11th and 12th centuries. Uh, in Japan, stories of hot springs that could heal wounds and restore youth were also common and still are to this day. Similar stories were prominent among the Caribbean people during the early uh, 
16th century, who spoke of restored, restorative powers of the water in the mythical land of Bimini. Similar legends have been found in the Canary Islands, Polynesia, and England, and it never stops. It never stops. Humanity has been on a search ever since sin entered into the human race and, 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 the, and Adam and Eve. There's been a void in humans that humans are trying to fill. And you can see what, you know, why would someone design the World Trade Centers? Why would somebody design, uh, I think it's in Dubai, I don't know if I'm saying that right, the tallest building in the world? Why, why do people draw this out on paper? You know, there's something that, that's saying, man, I, I've got to do something great with my life or whatever. Uh, last Monday, uh, I was in San Diego, and uh, Lee took me, Leland Paris took me out to, to the museum of the USS Midway, an aircraft carrier. It was the first aircraft carrier commissioned after World War II. And now it's a museum. And, I mean, this thing is huge. And we didn't even get to see all of it. We only saw probably a third of it. And the guys, they have these docent people are sitting around ready to talk to you about the aircraft carrier. And they have all these different systems and backup systems and backup systems to the backup system. And it's just amazing. And as I'm walking around there, I keep telling Lee, somebody had to draw this on paper with a pencil. They didn't have AutoCAD back then, no computers. Somebody, probably lots of somebodies, had to sit down and draw this whole thing out, all these systems where every pipe and every bundle of wires and all this stuff goes. Wow. People pouring their life into something and, and thinking that it's, it's, it's an accomplishment, that it's going to be the spark of life. So you ever notice that when people are really searching for something, how many people have ever lost anything and went looking for it? I usually find it after I'm looking for something else. When I give up and start looking for something else, then I find what I was looking for. But you ever notice that when you're looking for something, you always find it in the last place you look, right? Why is that? Well, it could be because there's no place else left to look. And it's the last place. Or it could be that once you find it, you don't need to look anymore. You find it in the last place that you look. Where, what are people looking for today that, to find that spark of life, to get out of the buffering wheel and, and, and make life count? People are looking everywhere. People are look, mostly people are trying to recapture their youth. I don't say most, I say mostly, that might not be accurate, but a lot of people are trying to recapture their youth. So there's a reason why a 57 Chevy cost $60,000 if you can find one for sale. There's a reason why a 67 Camaro, 68 Camaro, 69 Z28, 64 to uh, 71 uh, Mustangs, and there's a reason why those things cost thirty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. People are willing to pay that to recapture them because when they get in that car, they think that they're 16 again. Okay? If they can afford it. Uh, maybe some people are looking for that new car. You know, there's some new cars out there just outright annoying. The Mustangs. I, surely those pipes don't come on those cars from the factory. But there's a guy who, uh, I, don't, I haven't heard him in a while, but there's a, a, a construction yard uh, a few doors down from my kid's house on Arboga Road. And so the guys drive in there in the morning, they leave their cars there, and they drive out in company trucks. And for the longest time, every afternoon, this guy would pull out of that driveway with a new Mustang, and it was just ear-piercing. And he wasn't even really going that fast. But, you know, what are we doing, man? Finding that spark of life. Whoo, man, listen to me. Now I drive a diesel, 
and it's one of the quietest diesels on the road. And I'm okay with that. I don't need the loud stuff anymore. Probably because I can't hear it. People search for it, that it thing that's going to bring life to life in pleasure and entertainment, how many toys I can get, how much stuff I can stack up, how many tools we can get. Right, Nash? Yeah. You can never have too many tools. You know, you hardly see tool catalogs come in the mail anymore, but when they used to be coming in the mail and in the sale papers, I would be looking at those things every week, and I'd be going, oh, wow, wow. And then I realized, I already have one of those. Why do I want another one? This is something about that. You know, people trying to recapture their youth. Think Uncle Rico living in a van. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Napoleon Dynamite movie? Come on. If you haven't seen Napoleon Dynamite, you, come on. Uncle Rico is living in a camper van. He's out in the middle of nowhere, and he's got a VHS camera on a tripod, and all he's doing is throwing footballs in front of it all day long so he can watch himself and see how great he thinks he was. Whatever. The problem with all this is that people are looking on the outside for an inside fix. But looking out there for what is going to fix in here never quite gets the job done. It takes me from one near miss. Wow, that was great, but it just didn't quite do it. And sometimes we, sometimes we, we do something and it's just a total bomb. It isn't, it's a failure. But we're looking for something. And if you take your Bible to Luke chapter uh, 24... In Luke chapter 24, this is resurrection morning. We're going to be celebrating resurrection morning here in just about, what, three weeks? Easter Sunday, April 4th. That's also my spiritual birthday. I got born again on April 4th. In Luke 24, verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them, came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, the the two men in the shining apparel, this would, would be angels, these angels said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you, you're you're not even looking in the right place. You're looking for life and you're looking for it in the grave. And and that's, that's what happens when people are looking in the wrong place for that spark that's going to bring some life to my life, to get me out of the buffering wheel and, and get me onto something meaningful for my life. You know, I was thinking about economics. And that's a, a brain bender. I drive through town, and, and it's rush hour either in the morning or in the afternoon, and, and all these people are just intense about either getting to work or getting home. And I'm, I'm always trying, to what are they thinking about? What are they doing? Well, they're going to work so they can make money, so they can have a house to live in and a car to drive to work, to make money to pay for the house they live in and the car they're driving and this is a buffering wheel. It's like, what, what is the meaning of all of that? Where's the spark that gives life to their life? Jesus, or not Jesus, the angel said, you, you won't find life among the things that are dead. You can't found the, find the fountain of life if you're looking in the wrong place. In John 3, the first seven verses When Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, man, we know you're a teacher come from God because you're doing these miracles and nobody could do that unless God was with them. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. You must be born again. There is a spark that will bring life to your life that's not found in anything in this world. You must be born again. And I don't know how many testimonies I've heard of people over the years who sat in church for a long time and nobody knew they weren't born again. 
I remember there was a, a young man, if I said his name, some of you would probably remember him. And he was around here back in the 90s. And uh, he became friends with a lot of folks in church. He was a regular in church. He helped us work on the gym. And then uh, sometime after that, <clears throat> we had a water baptism service. And when you get baptized in water, you're going to give a testimony. And his testimony was, yeah, I just got saved last week. <laughs> he said, I just thought I would hang around here and check you guys out and see if you were for real. I, I didn't know the guy wasn't saved or born again. He wasn't doing or saying anything that would make me go, wow, that guy needs a good dose of the Holy Ghost. You know, get him straightened out. None of that. Hey, but you got to be born again. You must be born again. Born of the Spirit. Inside. It's an inside issue and it's an inside fix. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. You want to know the way out of the buffering wheel? Jesus is the way. He said, I'm the truth. You want to know which exit to take out of the buffering wheel? You take the truth, not the lie. And he said, I'm the life. I'm, the, I'm that spark that brings life. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an inside fix for an inside issue. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Paul says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. I'm, this is not coming from me, he said. I'm not doing this on my own. Verse 6. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. In John chapter 5, Jesus said to the, to the religious people of his day, the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures. He's talking to people who their whole livelihood and life focused on being interpreters of the law, the Old Testament. He said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. You think eternal life is, is in knowing the scripture, the word. But he said, These, this word that you're studying, it testifies of me, but you don't want me. You just want this religious facade. There's no life in that. He said, the, these scriptures testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Some people like the buffering wheel. Or they get out, they exit onto a lie that says this is the way to make life work. You know, I, if I had the uh, message Bible in here, I would read you the introduction to the prophets. If you have a message Bible at home, read the introduction. It's right before the book of Isaiah. And he talks about how prophets, uh, they challenge a lot of things in our lives. He said, mostly people, uh, we compartmentalize our lives into the, the secular and the sacred. We have our jobs and the things we do in life, and then we have our religious life at church. And we try to separate them. And he said, that's really designed to keep God on the margin of my life. But if, if we're going to have anything to do with God, he's going to be square in the center, right in the middle of my business. He's, he's not going to be on the margin. He's not going to be out there somewhere. In Romans 8, 14, Paul said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not, not people who can memorize the Bible. I remember years ago, my pastor preached one of his, I don't know, every sermon he preached was the greatest sermon ever preached. But uh, one Sunday morning, pastorhood, minister here, and then during our worship time, we had an altar call, and this fella uh, that had been in and out of prison most of his life, he, adult life, he came to the altar, and uh, I prayed with him, and you know what he said to me? He said, I read that Bible all the way through. He goes, I never heard any of that stuff before. Yeah. 
It's, it's not just the word. There's a spirit that goes with it. This is not, this is not a head thing. It's a heart thing. If we could cure the ills of humanity by doctoring the head, then all of our schools and education and higher education, all that stuff would be working, but it's not working. It's actually detrimental. It, 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 it gets people, uh, they exit the buffering wheel into the lie that says there's no God. We're going to do this all on our own. We've got to save the planet. I got news for you. You can't save the planet and you can't destroy it either. I'm not advocating being unwise stewards of what we have, but I'm just telling you there's no need to live in fear. God has a plan. I've read the book. I read the whole thing. I see, I see his plan from beginning to end, and the world is not going to disappear or blow up tomorrow. No humans are going to push the wrong button or get in a nuclear exchange with other nations and destroy the earth. The earth has at least a thousand and seven more years. So the earth is going to outlast everybody in this room. I believe the Bible teaches that there's going to be a catching away of the church. And somewhere just before, just after that, is going to, a covenant's going to be made between whoever the Antichrist is and the nation of Israel. And there's going to be seven years of great tribulation. Well, first three and a half years is just tribulation. The last three and a half, great tribulation on the earth. Then Jesus is going to come back with ten thousands of his saints. And Israel's going to rule with Jesus, rule the earth for a thousand years. And then the end is going to be. Okay? So there's at least a thousand. You can't destroy the earth and you can't save it. Okay? God's got a plan for that. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Some people get bored with their Christianity. I, I can't imagine that. But I know it happens. I know people just get, oh, well, it's Sunday, uh, you know. Um, or... It's Sunday, we'll go to church, we'll put in our time, and then the rest of the week we'll just do whatever we want. I'm bored with my Christianity. Well, there's a cure for the boredom. Because some people, even after you get born again, you can get stuck in the buffering wheel of just living a religious life without life. The cure for boredom, and, and this, uh, uh, these two points, A and B here, come from our Assemblies of God core values. If you, if you read our uh, Constitution and Bylaws for our church, they look a lot like the Assemblies of God overall, Constitution and Bylaws. And in our core values, which there are 16 of them, number seven is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And for about two weeks, this first uh, phrase here has been pounding around inside my head. All believers are entitled to. Hey, we live in an, an entitlement society. So if you think there's, if you're entitled to something, get entitled to this, okay? I, I, I'm entitled to this. It's for me. All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience of all in the early church. When you read the book of Acts, that's, that's what happened. People got saved, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. When Paul went to Ephesus, it says he found uh, a dozen believers there, and the first thing he wanted to know is what church you guys go to. You guys are going, you going, going to the right church? No, that's not what he was asking. He said, oh, you, you're a believer? Well, who's your pastor? He wasn't even interested in that. Paul's number one priority was to bring people to Christ. His second priority is you got the Holy Ghost since you believed. That was the next priority. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? This is the normal experience of the early church. With it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of the gifts and their use in the work of the ministry. And there's, there's verses listed out here, and we're not going to read them all this morning. But in Luke 24, 49... He says, go and wait, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father, till you are endued with power from on high. He was talking about Acts, and there's a misprint here. It's supposed to be Acts 2-4, not 1-4. Uh, 
In Acts 2, 4, on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, it said they were all in one place with one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house. It doesn't say the wind actually showed up. People's hair wasn't blowing. Pages of the books weren't flopping around. But there was a sound that filled the, the, the house where they were at, and it says, tongues of fire sat upon every person's head, and then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. What is that all about? Well, that brings, that brings real life to my life. That's the spark that makes life worth living. That's the, that gets me out of the buffering wheel of my religious everyday monotony. In Acts 1.8, he says, the, the reason this is going to happen, what this is all about is... When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit into your life, you're going to become a witness. There's never going to be a dull moment. You're going to be a witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, all the way to Croatia, where John and Kelly Haruska are heading. Why in the world are they going over there? Because they're being led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, I've got a work for you to do over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the whole chapter, talks about the members of the body and how that God puts, sets the members in the body as it pleased him. Not as it pleased me. You know, if it pleased me, uh, sometimes I wouldn't be the pastor. It's fun. It's great, but you don't know that public speaking is terrifying. And after 40 years of it, public speaking is still terrifying. I'm still scared of stumbling over my words. Sometimes when I get up and to get started, I'm doing pretty good now, but sometimes when I get up to get started, I, I talk myself out of hypervent. I, I try to control my breathing and keep my legs from shaking. And Pastor Al, after 40, yes, public speaking is not my gig. Well, I guess it is if the Lord places everybody in the body as it pleases him, okay? And when you find your place, the 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12 talks about when you, you find your place, all the members of the body are different, and they have a different function. And the, when you find your place, if you're led by the Spirit, he's going to lead you to your place in the body where you have service and ministry. That's what, that's what he has for you. I like to say it like this. Christianity is not a spectator sport. I know with the way we do church in modern America, uh, Christianity seems like a spectator sport because what are you all doing? You're all sitting there and all the chairs are facing the same way, right here. I remember years ago, there was, uh, we were, the Sunday night service and the ministry people were sitting up there on the stage and and there was a guy, I, I can't remember why he was here, but Pastor Hood asked him to sit up there. And so he was sitting right behind me. And right as church is getting ready to start, I turned around and I said to him, I said, does it make you nervous looking out there at all them people? He said, no. He goes, what makes me nervous is they're all looking back. <laughs> With the baptism in the Holy Spirit come experiences such as an overflowing fullness of the Spirit. John 7, 30. These are verses that you need to go home and look them up and read them today, read them tomorrow, read them the next day. An overflowing fullness of the Spirit. John 30, 7, 37. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He said, when you receive the Holy Spirit out of your inside, it's going to flow a river of living water. In Acts 4 and 8, it says, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and stood up and said, there's a boldness and a fullness that comes with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brings a deepened reverence for God. Acts 2.43, it says, fear came on every soul. In Hebrews 12.28, it says that they served God with reverence and godly fear. There's an intensified consecration to God and a dedication to his work. In Acts 2.42, it says they continued steadfastly. This is talking about thousands of people, thousands of people who got saved on the day of Pentecost. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will bring to my life a more active love for Christ, for his word, and for the lost. In Mark 16, verse 20, it says, And they went everywhere preaching the word, and the Lord worked with them, confirming his word, their word with signs following. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. The woman at the well. Seems like this, this chapter shows up in a lot of my messages lately. In and, and John chapter 4 and verse 13, you know, Jesus stops. He says, I need to go through Samaria. He stops at a well. His disciples go into town to get some food. And while they're gone, he's there by himself. A woman comes and Jesus says, hey, can you get me a drink? And she said, why are you asking me for a drink? Because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and there's animosity and blah, 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 this little prejudice thing going on. And Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. When you keep dipping into the, to the barrel of the world's goods, looking for that spark of life, you're always going to have to go looking for another barrel or go back and, and try to make it work again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Woo, come on. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said, hey, give me some of this water. She still doesn't quite get it. But she said, give me some of that so that I won't have to keep thirsting. Verse 21, Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God's on a search. God is searching. And if we're searching, you know, every once in a while you see a movie where someone's lost and the person that's lost is searching for the way out and the searchers are searching for that person. And when they find each other, it's a great celebration, right? When you drink of this water, you never thirst again. It becomes a fountain inside of me. It's a flow of everlasting life. And this flowing, that wellspring of life is the secret to never-ending worship. It just works. It's never-ending. It's a, it's a continual flow of life. It's, and life never gets boring. Life never gets boring because you're always, you're always on the scout. You're always looking for somebody to say, hey, do you know about Jesus? Jesus. Or uh, Bobby says, the way he approaches it, Bobby will ask somebody, he'll, say, he'll, say, he'll either say, have you heard about Jesus? And if they say yes, he says, what have you heard? Tell me what you know. You know? Or what do you know about Jesus? I'm going to tell you. Jesus, and then it's testimony time. It's not theology time. Theology, you can't win people by, by attacking their brain with theology. It's not a brain issue. It's a heart issue. And so when you, say, when you give testimony that Jesus forgave me of my sins, he delivered me from this or that, he restored my health, or whatever, whatever God's done for you is your testimony. And there's, it's never a dull moment. You're always looking for somebody to, to say something to. Now, if you haven't got there yet, we're going to close it out this morning with... The search. It's not even... Uh, the reason I'm doing this this morning is I'm feeling like God wants to baptize people in the Holy Spirit and he wants to do it because you're, you're seeking him out. You know, sometimes it happens, you come to church and you hear a sermon and if it's a salvation sermon, there's an altar call and we just keep reeling and reeling and reeling until we get somebody to the altar. 
Or we give an altar call for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And I I don't think it's going to be that way. I mean, that's good. We're still going to do that. But I think that God wants us to get in to the seek him mode. He wants us to seek him out. And it's a searching. In Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently. Emphasis on diligently is added by me. Those who seek me diligently will find me. And I, I, I don't know why. I don't remember the occasion. But when I first came on staff here in 1981, I ended up with a... Uh, a three by five card taped to my desk, the corner of my desk with a, with a packing tape, you know, so it was comp- like laminated onto my desk. I did it. I can't remember why, but I put down this phrase right here, diligence. The definition of diligence is a steady, earnest, and energetic application to a task. Whatever, whatever, my, whatever my task is, I've got to be steady and earnest and serious about it and energetic. I've got to put some of my energy into it if it's going to work. If we're going to seek God, we need to seek him steadily, not just come Sunday and wait for an altar call. We need to seek him steadily, earnestly. Be serious about it. During the week, go to bed at night meditating. God, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. God, just baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Let that be your thoughts when you're driving down the road. Let it be your thoughts when you're going to bed at night. Be your thoughts when you're reading your Bible. Earnest and energetic. Apply ourselves to seeking God. And if, if it's not the Holy, baptism of the Holy Spirit that, that you need at the moment, if you're already baptized in the Holy Spirit, whatever you need from the Lord, seek Him earnestly. Be steady about it. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord. Wait. Don't be in such a big hurry to go do everything all the time. You know, it's okay to sit down somewhere with a cup of coffee or whatever and just meditate on the things of the Lord. Just sit down and say, Lord, I love you. I had a song stuck in my head yesterday and this morning. And I don't even know the words to it. But the end of the chorus, I think, is, Jesus, Jesus, how I love you. I want to know you more. That's not a very good rendition. But I just want to know him more. I I want to know him more. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to hear the voice of God. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be a witness. I want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God, fruitful for the master. Wait upon the Lord and you'll renew your strength. You don't have to run in your own power all the time. Wait upon the Lord, renew your strength. You will mount up with wings like eagles. You'll run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. In Jeremiah 29, we just read it this morning. You're going to call on me. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me. With all your heart. Think about it. What is it that I do? Examine your life this morning, right now, and try to come up with an answer to this question. What is it that I search for with all my heart? Where is my, where is my heart go? Where does it go? Tomorrow morning when you get up, You know, your life is going to be filled with a lot of stuff. You're going to go to work. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Where does your heart go? Not your your head, not your car. Where, Where does my heart go? What is it that I'm searching for with all my heart? What has my heart? It has to be Jesus. Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. If you set your mind to seek the Lord around the clock. I'm not talking about quitting your job and going into 24-hour prayer or anything like that. I'm talking about no matter what I do, he's right there. Hosea 6.3, let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. If we set our heart to seek the Lord... It says, he will come to us like the rain. 
like the latter and former reign to the earth. Wow. I can't think of anything better than to have God reign his presence on me. What else, what else is there? Oh, there's a lot of stuff to do and a lot of stuff that's fun. But man, none of it, none of it touches that thing inside of us like the rain when God rains his presence on us. Isaiah 55, I'm going to invite our worship team to come back this morning and get ready to lead us in a time of worship and praise. Isaiah 55 and 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He's near. It's time. The scripture says, Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Call on him while he's near. I mean, where can you get any nearer to God than in a Holy Ghost Pentecostal church? Well, it's easy to figure out where you can get any closer to God because in Acts chapter 17, verse 27 and 28, am I there? Nope, not yet. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. He's talking about, you know, finding God. I drive down the road a lot of times. And I'm looking out at the sky, and sometimes if there's clouds, you know, and you're looking at the clouds and you have the blue sky, and you're thinking, God, who in the world are you? He fills all of that. And as far as that endless expanse reaches, he's there. I don't know, God, I don't even know who you are. I don't even, I've been a Christian for 46 years almost, and I, I'm telling you, I don't even know who God is. I know who I think he is sometimes. I think I get a little communication from him sometimes. But God, who in the world are you? Wow. Seek the Lord. Grope after him. If we could find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Praise the Lord. I'm going to read you one last passage here from 2 Kings. And it's in verse 13. And Elisha is dying. 2 Kings 13. It said, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. He's, he, Joash is not exactly the best of kings. Um, he's had a heavy dependence on the prophet. And he's losing Basically, he feels like he's losing his connection with God because Elisha's dying. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he takes a bow and he takes some arrows. And when you read the story a little bit, I'm going to jump ahead and then come back. In verse 18, he said, then he said, take the arrows and he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. This guy was a wimp. This guy had no zeal about, I mean, this would cause him to give up his man card. Because Elisha said, take the bow and some arrows. He took the bow and he took some arrows. In verse 16, he said, Then as he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on the bow. And Elisha had to put his hand on the king's hand. Come on, dude, get it up there. Act like you're serious about this thing. And he said, Open the east window. So he opened the window and he said, Shoot. And he shot an arrow. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said, strike the ground. So he struck three times and he quit. 
That's it. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. You should have put some energy into this thing like you mean business. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Hey, well, at some point, as Christians, if you want to be a Pentecostal Christian, you got to you got to stir up some moxie in your life. You got to say, you know what? I, I'm not a wimp. I'm going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to seek God until He fills me. For a Pentecostal church, people who believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the and speaking in tongues and the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, I, I would say our percentage of people who walk in that is probably pretty low. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you got to stir that thing up. It doesn't stir itself. You need to stir it up. Stir it up by seeking God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, seeking Him. Lord, I, I want to be filled tomorrow. You know, if God doesn't fill you with the Holy Ghost this morning, you need to be after it again tomorrow. Don't wait till next Sunday. Be after it again tomorrow. Be after it again on Tuesday. After him again on Wednesday. After him again on Thursday. Keep after him and after him because those who seek me with all their heart will find me. You, are you happy about finding him? Glory to God. Let's stand up this morning and let's find him.